The China and Africa podcast is brought to you in partnership with the African China Reporting Project at Wits University in Johannesburg. The ACRP promotes balanced, considered reporting on Africa China relations through innovative training programs held throughout the year. More information at africachinareporting.co.za. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast, a proud member of the Seneca Network from SubChina. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by Kobus van Staden, the senior China-Africa researcher at the South African Institute of International Affairs in Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good afternoon to you, Kobus. Good afternoon. Kobus, one of the things we've been doing in our daily newsletter now is expanding the focus of the China-Africa engagement uh, from beyond Africa and talking a lot more about issues that are happening in the Persian Gulf, the Mediterranean, the Red Sea, and of course in the Mideast at large. Because one of the things that we're finding is that the lines don't stop just at the borders of Africa and then all of a sudden everything's different when you go into the Red Sea, the Gulf of Aden, and into the Persian Gulf countries. So a lot of the issues now that are affecting geopolitical trends in in Africa are also playing out in other parts. Let's take a look right now at the China-Iran deal that's underway that's being talked about. This is a 25-year deal. $400 billion is the word on the street. Now, a lot of people will think, well, what does that have to do with Africa? Well, if this deal does go through, and it's still in its negotiation phases at the time of this recording, uh, it potentially could really have an impact on African oil producers, but it also represents a profound shift in some of the geopolitics that are underway between the United States, Iran, the Persian Gulf, Saudi Arabia. It gets very, very complicated. Another part of this, Kobus, is the fact that there's a growing military presence from the Chinese in the Horn of Africa, particularly in Djibouti. And this has been a focus of conversation in the United States. When we talk about the great power rivalry in Washington, D.C., every single time is the U.S. military presence in Djibouti. And that's come to symbolize in many ways the challenge that China's bringing to the United States for hegemony in this part of the world. So a lot of overlapping issues at play here. Uh, but the Red Sea area in particular is one uh, that's very interesting with a lot going on. Yes, this this issue also brings a kind of a conceptual challenge, I think, um, frequently to to particularly to to Western onlookers, in the sense that as China is scrambling some of these traditional divisions between, say, Africa and the Middle East, it's also scrambling some of the traditional divisions between economic engagement and military engagement. We're seeing the, the we're seeing Chinese actors in in places like Djibouti doing both, um, and you know, kind of which which adds a, it's, it's a kind of a fresh challenge, I think, to Western conceptions of of how things are. Done. So today we're going to be talking about great power rivalry in the Red Sea area. But before we go on to our discussion, I think it would be helpful to just quickly map out for those of you at home who may not be as familiar with this part of the world. Uh, the Red Sea is a strategically vital, important, and they're actually, uh, let me count them, six countries that border the Red Sea. And when, when you hear me kind of detail these countries, you'll see why it's so important. Now, on the eastern shore, we're talking about Saudi Arabia and Yemen. On the western shore, it's Egypt, Sudan, Eritrea, and Djibouti. The focus for us today is probably going to be uh, Djibouti. And Djibouti is at this really amazing geographical point. You know what they say in real estate, Cobus? Location, location, location. And boy, Djibouti has the ultimate location. It's at the mouth of the Red Sea. It's also at the mouth of the Gulf of Aden. It's a short hop over into the Persian Gulf and the Straits of Hormuz, which is where a lot of the world's oil flows through. And then it's just around the corner from the Indian Ocean, and that puts it into a lot of traffic and geopolitical interest. So let's get uh, you know some perspective on this. And for that, we are thrilled to have on the program for the first time Zach Verton, who's a non-resident fellow uh, in the Brookings Foreign Policy Department. And he's really an author of this new essay that came out last month, Great Power Rivalry in the Red Sea, China's Experiment in Djibouti and implications for the United States. A very good morning to you from Minnesota. Zach, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Eric. To uh, Thanks to both you and Cobus. I'm, uh, of course, a big fan of the podcast and your project more broadly. So happy to be with you and uh, excited also to hear about your likewise stretching uh, across the Red Sea and, and covering more uh, developments uh, in the Gulf and Middle East as well. Yeah. So it's funny because when I was reading your paper, it really echoed a lot of the sentiments that we've been kind of, you know, bringing to the, the newsletter and the podcast over the past few months in terms of broadening that focus. Uh, you talk a lot about how 
in this part of the world, a number of geopolitical interests in theaters overlap with one another. So we have the Indo-Pacific theater, we have Red Sea, Gulf of Aden, we have obviously the Horn of Africa. Unpack some of these different issues and why Djibouti in particular comes to be such a, an area of interest. Yeah, so Djibouti has obviously gotten a lot of attention given it's now playing host both to the United States and, and Chinese militaries uh, and, and home to these two global heavyweights, but it also sits at the center of this increasingly uh, charged region, this Red Sea region you described. And it is far from only the U.S. and China who are jockeying for influence, right? So there are small states from the Gulf, most notably the UAE and Qatar, uh, middle powers like Turkey and Saudi Arabia, have really in recent years made a kind of mad dash for real estate, as I call it, on Africa's Red Sea coast, uh, snapping up commercial ports, military outposts, infrastructure projects, um, as each of these countries sort of redefines the borders of its own near abroad. Um, and, and this kind of co competition for influence and market share, uh, as you alluded, has really blurred the political geography in the region, has begun to erase old boundaries between the Middle East and Africa and shape a kind of new set of trans-regional dynamics. And that's something I think we are still yet to fully uh, comprehend or, or respond to, particularly in the West. Um, at the center of that region, of course, is the Bab el-Mandeb Strait, a, a really critical choke point for military strategists the world round, but also one of the world's most heavily trafficked shipping lanes. So uh, th this research sort of situates Djibouti within that Red Sea region, um, but also this wider Indo-Pacific, right? And this increasingly pivotal region um, where many really think, many strategists believe China's continued rise will be negotiated. Um, so there are those for whom the Indo-Pacific is kind of a separate domain, um, but increasingly I found in this research, and, and I, I put myself in this camp, uh, those who think Djibouti and the East African coasts are really the kind of Western flank uh, of the Indo-Pacific. Can you um, log kind of contextualize the concept of the Indo-Pacific for us a little bit? Like, you know, it's, you know, for, for I think for people who don't follow these kind of strategic affairs, it, it seems to have kind of come out of nowhere. Or it's, it's, there's a kind of a vogue at the moment in, in describing these the region as 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 these two oceans as connected and as essentially one zone. How like what is the history of that way of thinking about it? Yeah, good, great question, and, and and new to me in part as well. Um, uh, as I said, there, there are those who think the, the Horn of Africa now represents the sort of western flank of this region, but but really this kind of broader expanse stretching from really the west coast of the United States across uh, vast oceans uh, to India and to the Indian Ocean, and and again in some in some definitions further to the East African co coast. Um, this is obviously a region that's home to. Uh, vital sea lines of communication to huge majorities of the world's population, of GDP, of seaborne trade and, and high volume ports. But it's also, uh, I think, in response to China and to China's expanding aims both in the region and more broadly. And, and we'll, you'll see that a year ago or two years ago, uh, the U.S. military itself rebranded its Pacific Command as, as the sort of Indo-Pacific, um, kind of recognizing the increasing connectivity of of these two oceans. So that's kind of where the concept comes from. Uh, and again, the question is whether if you look at China's expanding BRI projects, its land and sea corridors, uh, those are obviously stretching to the Middle East, through the Red Sea and onto the Mediterranean, um, but also increasingly uh, via places like Djibouti into Africa. And so uh, does that sort of interconnected uh, vision uh, you know, apply to Djibouti and Djibouti to the African coast. And I think, uh, you know, I certainly found over the course of my research uh, that there are those who think that Beijing uh, is, is arguably deploying a more effective mix uh, of diplomacy and commercial or economic statecraft and technology uh, across what appears to be in some ways a more expansive and more integrated vision of the Indo-Pacific. Uh, again, that includes Djibouti, Djibouti and the East African coast. That's really an amazing statement to hear when you really compare the military resources of the People's Liberation Army and People's Liberation Army Navy compared to, say, the American fleets and AFRICOM and, and, and Central Command in that part of the world. The scale, the difference is enormous uh, between resources. And to hear that you're suggesting that there is uh, 
some parity there, at least in terms of strategy, is 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 to me very very interesting. Let's let's stay on the military theme in Djibouti before we get to the bigger picture here. Uh, this is a base that opened up in 2017. Uh, it was about six hundred million dollars. It's the first overseas base that the Chinese have. It really, again, crystallized for American military planners. The 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 in in some ways it visualized what the rise of China will look like. Talk to us a little bit about the the importance of this base and what it does and why they picked Djibouti. Yeah, well, good question. Um, a couple of ways to answer that. I, I think it's it's useful to sort of. Uh, frame this in terms of two different narratives or two different approaches to date as I do in the report. Now, the United States arrived in Djibouti a couple decades ago in 2001, had, was focused very narrowly on a counterterrorism agenda. Uh, you know, it acquired Camp Le Monnier, the sort of only uh, enduring military base in Africa, and, and which has since served as a staging ground for U.S. counterterrorism and surveillance, surveillance missions across the Red Sea. Um, but, you know, while Washington paid its annual lease on the facility and expanded it considerably, um, accompanying investments in Djibouti were few. Um, Now, China, on the other hand, arrived much more recently in Djibouti, focused first on major economic investments, and this military presence followed. And I agree with you, uh, this base is is likely the first of more to come on the continent, in the Red Sea, uh, and the Indian Ocean. Um, And so I, I think the base is kind of interesting. One of the themes for me is that this is a testing ground. Uh, not only for the Chinese, but also for the Americans and for everyone else reacting to China's expansion in the region and, and this new place, uh, new base, excuse me, and, and a place that will inevitably set precedence for overseas relations with the Chinese going forward. Um, so for, for Beijing, I think uh, the, base, the base or this outpost is a means of beginning to project influence across the Indian Ocean. I, I don't actually, I think, you know, the, the militaries are nowhere near parity and, and the, certainly the st- sort of strategic footprint around the world is nowhere near parity. Uh, but the base has caused many in the Pentagon and in the West more broadly to rethink uh, you know, what were once established truths about Chinese military doctrine, about its its prohibition on basing troops overseas, and what that means now for uh, the PLA's expeditionary capabilities, about sea power development. So nowhere near parity now, but, but what this means uh, going forward for the PLA and for Chinese ambitions is really the question. And, and I'll just say lastly, you know, this is projecting influence. What does that mean? Uh, that's kind of a general term. I, I think this is about protecting Chinese interests in the region and, and its nationals um, uh, on both sides of the Red Sea. I think it's about keeping an eye on trade and energy supply routes. Um, but it's also, as I detail in the report, a, a place where the PLA, both its officers and troops, can gain experience, really, uh, whether that's operating naval platforms in the Red Sea and Gulf of Aden, whether it's working with a host government in Djibouti, uh, and and gain experience also by learning from other militaries, not least the, that of the United States. Um, and and in terms of finally your question about why did they pick Djibouti, um, I do think this is a place where uh, the PLA and and Beijing can gauge international reaction to the kind of flexing of Chinese muscle outside the Western Pacific or outside of its immediate back, backyard for the first time. And in that, um, you, you know, I, I do think this was not an accidental choice in Djibouti. Obviously, it serves their market in Ethiopia, and there are lots of reasons, interest to have it there at the mouth of the Red Sea. Um, but there were also five other militaries, foreign militaries, already operating there. And so to set up in Djibouti, I think one can argue, um, may have led to less scrutiny or less uh, sort of negative reaction um, given the presence of those other militaries than had they set up a new base in Kenya or Tanzania or somewhere else on the on the East African coast. So as you mentioned, the, the two bases, the U.S. and the Chinese bases, are, are quite close together. Um, how how have their relationship, how have they co- their coexistence proceeded since the Chinese base started there. I remember in 2018 there was an incident where there were allegations of of lasers being being aimed at US pilots um like I think landing planes um and there was complaints that, that some of them suffered injuries. Um you know kind of beyond that incident um how how is is you know coexistence going? You're right. Yeah. I mean the, the reason this caused so much sort of heartburn in, in U.S. national security circles when it was announced was that the base 
uh, is, as you mentioned, uh, just about six miles from the existing U.S. base, and, and, and that's been the source of the anxiety. Um, in terms of their interaction on the ground, I detail a fair amount of this in the report. You write there was the incident of lazing, which got up a lot of attention. There have been a number of other uh, incidents, none of them major, but uh, all of which sort of cause concern uh, in, among Western militaries about interactions either uh, on land or at sea in, in, in and around this increasingly crowded ports complex and where the, the sort of trade function of the ports and the military access for the U.S. military and other militaries, uh, this all sort of comes together in a very small territory. So there have been other issues about flight vectors and about use of the airport, um, again, uh, incidents at sea and, and other incidents uh, that are new, right? The, the PLA, this is their first overseas uh, base and they are finding their way. Everyone suggests that they are learning and learning and fast and some mistakes have been made. Um, but uh, the, the interactions have been, I would argue, increasingly, uh, or not increasingly, the, the interactions have been minimal uh, in part because there's a very real reluctance on the part of the U.S. military to engage the Chinese. And there's a number of reasons for that, uh, mostly fear about counterintelligence and concern that anything the PLA le learns in Djibouti may have global implications amid this broader struggle or broader tension. Um, I, I'm not a military strategist, but I'm also not convinced of this approach. You know, I think you can argue that uh, the tide is coming in, uh, that the, this will be the first of more Chinese military bases to come. And if, in fact, the PLA is learning, then why aren't the established powers uh, like the United States and the U.S. military doing it what it can to shape their curriculum? Support for this podcast comes from the Africa China Reporting Project at Wits University School of Journalism in Johannesburg. The ACRP provides reporting grants, workshops, and other professional development opportunities for both African and Chinese journalists. Follow the ACRP on Twitter at Wits China Africa or visit africachinareporting.co.za for information about grants and upcoming seminars. Let's move on from Djibouti and look at the broader uh, Red Sea region, and this incorporates Saudi Arabia. And I think Saudi Arabia is one of the more interesting spaces to watch, in part because uh, the Chinese now have replaced the United States as the kingdom's largest buyer of oil. Uh, they're the number one customer today. Uh, Egypt is also a key player, and it's one of those that, again, I think upsets the traditional balance of power because for much of the Cold War leading up even into the Obama era— uh, the United States was was really, in many ways, the dominant foreign actor in Egypt, providing somewhere around two to three billion dollars of aid every year, really supporting the Mubarak government right up until the very end, uh, and has been kind of a central actor. Now, now we see people like Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi going to Cairo, uh, bringing his Xinjiang message there, boldly kind of saying, you know, talking about what they're doing in Xinjiang and not really fearing any repercussions uh, of all of that. At the same time, today the news came out that Egypt will be the manufacturing hub for any future Chinese COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, the Egyptian health minister was the first minister of, from any country to visit China at the height of the COVID-19 outbreak. And the Chinese really recognized that to be of symbolic importance. So what we're seeing here, particularly in Egypt, is a lot more investment, a lot more diplomatic engagement. And in some ways, it does feel like, and again, I don't know if this is perception or reality, that the Chinese are challenging the, the traditional role that the U.S. has had as the dominant foreign actor in Egypt. Uh, talk to us a little bit about Saudi Arabia and Egypt. Yeah, well, I mean, I think this is true all across the Red Sea region. I think, you know, uh, some in the U.S. Uh, who came to this more recently are surprised to note that you know, Chinese investments, as you two well know, outstripped uh, U.S. investments in the Horn and in Africa more than a decade ago. And the same is true on the other side uh, of the Red Sea, where Chinese investments continue to grow in, in Saudi Arabia, as you mentioned, and all across the Gulf. Uh, and I think there, there is, uh, quite obviously, you couple that with uh, a, a broader disinterest in the region or a narrative of Washington's withdrawal from the region. And we are confronting some new realities there. Um, I think, in fact, there's a, there's a point, uh, an anecdote from Djibouti that, that is relevant here more broadly. And that is, uh, you know, there's been a lot of criticism about uh, Chinese coming and the Djiboutians accepting, you know, large infrastructure investments and, and large debt as a result. 
Um, and the Americans have come and said, look, why are you doing this? Uh, the Chinese are dangerous. You shouldn't be uh, getting so close. And the Djiboutians, uh, I think, interestingly say, look, uh, you, the Americans, have been here for 20 years. We asked you for help with these things. We asked you to aid in our development, a, a railroad, a water pipe, some of these infrastructure projects, uh, and you didn't deliver. You, the French, didn't deliver others. So don't turn around and criticize us for accepting Chinese help uh, when they come and respond to our asks. Uh, and that, for me, you know, that's a very common uh, narrative uh, that I found in my re own research in Djibouti, but it also uh, is one that you see in, uh, across much of the region. And so, and, and how do people in Washington respond when you tell them that? How, what's their response? Because I, I, I bet you they sound incredulous. <laughs> um, there certainly is some of that. Uh, I do think there is a, a broader acceptance or a broader uh, knowledge that the ground is shifting, however, um, that we can't necessarily compete with Chinese economic muscle, that we do have to have a more realistic strategy, um, both in Djibouti, but also in Saudi Arabia and the Horn more, more broadly. And I think the sooner folks in Washington recognize that and adapt their strategy, as I talked about in the report, to a more asymmetrical approach, focusing on real benefits and comparative advantages and smarter investments downstream, uh, I think that will be uh, better for the United States. I, I, you know, by contrast, I think, you know, I, I disagree with Secretary Pompeo's approach in the region to date. Uh, I do think we would be wise to, in fact, limit uh, the Cold War kind of us versus them narrative. Um, conversations in Egypt, in Saudi Arabia, in Djibouti, uh, it's, it will all reveal that uh, th this kind of narrative does the, the West very little good, does Washington very little good. Most states have no interest in being drawn into another foreign rivalry and, and frankly see the benefits of cooperating with both Washington and Beijing. How, how optimistic are you that, say, you know, there, there's a change in administration in November in the U.S., that a, a new administration might be more more amenable to 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 following the somewhat more developmentalist kind of approach to the region? Well, I, it would be hard to think that there won't be a different outlook, you know, from a from an administration that has really shown. Uh, very little interest in Africa and the region has sometimes been uh, quite condescending. Uh, I, I imagine there would likely be uh, quite a shift from a Biden administration. Uh, where where this region fits in the broader uh, pecking order will be difficult to say. Of course, there's a lot of damage to be repaired. Um, I do think there'll be a different outlook, a greater embrace of multilateralism, uh, a desire to go and rebuild alliances and partnerships uh, in, in all regions, um, where, where in fact the Red Sea and, and certainly the African side of the Red Sea fits in that, I, I think that will be determined, uh, but I, I think it's critically important. I don't know. I'm, I'm not as optimistic uh, on that. A couple of reasons, and I'd like to get your, your, your take on this. Number one, I don't think a Biden administration is going to be any softer on China. I think it works politically in the United States to be tough on China, and I don't think the tariffs are going to come down. I can't see there's a constituency in the United States that's advocating for a more measured approach with China right now. So, so, that, so to me, the, the China side of this will, will probably stay quite firm. In terms of the rhetoric changing, Cobus, you and I have been covering this since 2010. Hillary Clinton was saying that stuff a decade ago. And then Obama really didn't do much in Africa, but yet his subordinates at the State Department were saying very much the same things. And so we really haven't seen a lot of progression on U.S. thinking vis-a-vis -vis the Chinese and Africa for the past, say, 10 to 15 years. So I'm skeptical that all of a sudden, just from a Trump to a Biden transition, we're going to see this the suppleness that's needed or this change of policy, as you talked about, Zach, in terms of having a mix of development with military and, and the, the kind of all of government approach that the Chinese are bringing. Uh, how would you respond to that? Oh, no, I, I, I definitely agree. I don't think that the approach to China will be uh, will suddenly become, uh, you know, a 180. I, I do think there has quite obviously been a realization, uh, a bipartisan realization that uh, the what we thought might happen with China globally in terms of our relationship and, and international order didn't come to fruition. And so folks on both sides of the aisle are looking to uh, sort of redefine a strategy. What I think uh, is more likely is that you will see both more consistency in policy towards China, but also a greater focus, not necessarily on 
uh, us versus them or on a, a kind of Cold War mentality in the region, uh, but one hopefully uh, that invests more in those partnerships, that invests in those alliances, that sees that the best strategy for countering China is in fact sound and consistent diplomacy in the region. And, and I think that's been uh, severely lacking to date. I wonder what, what, you know, kind of in your research, what what's the kind of conclusion you came to about the role of the Djiboutian government in in all of this? Um, you know, some particularly for in the in the in the debt trap debate, um, countries like Djibouti, and it's frequently mentioned by name, is frequently characterised as countries with either very few options or not a lot of savvy, kind of being being led into this kind of trap of excessive debt by China. Um, but you know, in your paper, the Djiboutian government comes up as <laughs> comes off as as quite savvy in, in lots of ways and actually playing the US and China off against each other. Um, like, where did you end on, the, on that issue? Yeah, I'm really glad you asked, Govis, because I think <laughs> all too often uh, Djiboutian agency gets lost in this mix in this larger conversation about great powers. And, and of course, uh, they have been a very real factor in this equation and in the change in relationships there. And I think that's very easy to lose from afar. And so I went and asked Djiboutians, folks in the government, from the private sector, sector ordinary workers, you know, both in Djibouti and the region about these larger questions uh, as their country has become a kind of touchstone in this larger debate. Um, and I hope some of the interviews and commentary highlighted in the report bring that forward. Um, the issue of debt vulnerability has been has dominated most Western discourse uh, on Djibouti, as I said, over the last few years. You know, one point on the context for those that are new to this debate and then one on the specifics what we have here, I think, is a deeply asymmetrical relationship. Uh, Djibouti is very small. Uh, it's home to a million people, boasts very few natural resources, and its GDP uh, is about $3 billion a year, uh, roughly equivalent to Chinese output every two hours, as I say in the report. Um, so as a small country keen to develop, I think this debt ex kind of debt exposure is understandably high, but also you know, high enough that it has warrant some legitimate, some legitimate questions. Um, the worry here, of course, is that Beijing amasses too great a share of the country's portfolio, uh, that Djiboutians become too reliant on their new benefactors, and soon they're vulnerable, you know, if not for an outright debt for equity swap at one of its valuable ports, uh, then to at least to the kind of pressure that could result um, in strategic decisions that, you know, crudely put may be good for China and bad for the United States or other uh, competitors. Uh, on the specifics, you know, this case has been uh, mischaracterized as much as any in the debt trap diplomacy debate. And at the center of it is the Dorlay container terminal, the kind of crown jewel of Djibouti's ports complex. Um, now, there was a bit of a scare in, in 2018, which made its way all the way to Capitol Hill and rumors about uh, that Djibouti, after kicking out its Emirati ports operator, um, you know, had ceded control of the of this really critical terminal to the Chinese, um, which has you know a Chinese company which has stakes in several of Djibouti's other ports, uh, and one of which was constructed essentially adjacent to the new PLA base. Um, so, in theory, this would be a problem, and indeed, I think it's something to keep an eye on. Um, but in practice, you know, the rumors really outstripped the reality. Uh, I visited the port, and of the 700 employees there, only a ha small handful are Chinese. The Djiboutian operators, uh, you know, really take pains to explain and to outline that the infrastructure on site is of Western origin, that throughput has gone up since they assumed control, uh, that they have revenues to, sufficient to pay off their debts, and they have no interest in really ceding uh, sovereignty to the, Chinese, to the Chinese. So I'm personally skeptical uh, about any intentional strategy uh, from the Chinese to induce default. And I think there are uh, very real reasons that that would run counter to Beijing's interest in the region. But doesn't Djibouti have one card that almost nobody else has. So you're right. It's small. It's poor. It is. Uh, it doesn't produce any natural resources, but it's got a magical location. And does it see that as leverage? That's saying, listen, China, if you you don't want to play ball, there's you know a number of other militaries that do actually want to set up bases here. So right now, I think. Correct me if I'm wrong. The French have a base. The Japanese have a base in Djibouti, which is remarkable. The Americans have a base. The Chinese have a base. And I'm missing one other. Does the UAE or who else? The Germans, I think. The Germans have a base? There are several other smaller European contingents that... That is uh, crazy you know, that the Germans have a base there. <laughs> wow. Well, they're... Well, I wouldn't call them uh, bases. Some of those are co-located with the Americans, and okay. there are certainly multiple military presences there. And you're right. I mean, the Djiboutians have played this uh, to their advantage, the strategic location, both on the economic side in terms of its 
uh, expanding deep water ports complex and, and trying to provide uh, a viable alternative uh, to those ports, uh, such as Jebel Ali uh, in Dubai or in uh, the UAE and, and to others in the region, uh, but also in the military sense. The Djiboutians know very well uh, if they look out there. Back door, they see the Bab el Mandeb Strait, as I mentioned, one of the world's most heavily trafficked shipping lanes and, and, and really a critical choke point uh, for military strategists. So you do have this, this proliferation of bases there. We've also seen interest from the Emiratis, from the Russians, from the Saudis, uh, even from the Indians. And so uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, and to Kobus's earlier question, I think they have. Uh, maximize this as much as possible, tried to leverage both their economic, uh, the economic and potential military uh, objectives of, of a lot of these foreign actors. Now, uh, it, is, it, it got a little dicey for them between the U.S. and Chinese at various points, um, but they are doing what any sovereign country should in, in trying to maximize their interests. And again, I think you're very right to highlight uh, the often missing ingredient here of Djiboutian agency um, in, in this equation. So if, if you look across the, the entire sub-region, how successful do you think a, a, a developmental and d- diplomatic tool um, has the, the Belt and Road Initiative been for China? Obviously, there's uh, so much discussion about the BRI, but, but how much impact is the, is the BRI actually having on the ground? Yeah, wow, big question. Um, surely, you know, the BRI has been hotly debated, both both abroad, but also increasingly domestically in, in China. Um, I do think uh, the Chinese see Djibouti and the port there as a, as a kind of critical outpost, a critical depot in the larger uh, sort of BRI backbone that stretches across the northern rim of the Indian Ocean. Uh, and, and not only for its access to uh, the Red Sea and to the European markets, but of course also uh, to one of Africa's biggest players uh, next door in Ethiopia. And, and of course, the, the nature of the relationship, uh, political, economic, security in Djibouti is all very much tied to uh, Chinese interests in, in Ethiopia, where they have obviously invested huge, where they see p- great potential in terms of uh, growing energy demands, uh, the, the kind of uh, opening up of the commercial market there, 110 uh, million consumers. That really is, is I think, uh, uh, the, the source of, of Chinese interest here. And I think that, that story, how it plays out in the, in the relationship between the Chinese and Ethiopia going forward, will, will give us an important chapter in the continuing debate about uh, BRI and its efficacy in the region. So interesting that we are 33 minutes into a discussion about China and the Red Sea area that also includes Sudan, and we haven't mentioned Sudan once. Had we had this discussion four or five years ago, uh, we wouldn't have been talking about Djibouti at all. We'd be talking about Sudan because that was one of the top 10 oil suppliers. Khartoum, the government there, was a strong ally of the Chinese in the region. Uh, and it was it was very, very important. And China National Petroleum Corporation, CNPC, has massive investments now today. The Chinese have been very active in peacekeeping operations in South Sudan. But it Sudan doesn't seem to be... Uh, as important anymore. Talk to us a little bit about their role in the Red Sea area. Yeah, you're right. Um, well, a couple of things. First, in terms of the Chinese, uh, uh, of course, we know that Sudan was a, a sort of uh, principal testing ground for China's quote unquote going out strategy in the mid 2000s. And because of its isolation from the West, it provided a ready market for uh, Chinese diplomacy and Chinese uh, commerce. And, and you know, until recent changes in the Communist Party, it also was a legacy item for many, uh, many of the sort of old political guard in China uh, uh, who helped craft that strategy. Uh, but, you know, obvious developments over the, over the last uh, 10 years, uh, starting with the separation of Sudan and South Sudan, uh, followed by, uh, you know, uh, really diminishing oil reserves and, and ultimately coming to date and the change of government in Khartoum, uh, this has led the Chinese to rethink, uh, I think, their their priorities there. Um, and uh, while they haven't wanted to abandon Sudan for fear of uh, what that might look like to other countries in Africa, I think they're 
their interests uh, in economic and other terms have shifted to elsewhere in the region. You mentioned Egypt and Saudi Arabia. Uh, we obviously know about Djibouti and elsewhere in the Horn. Uh, I think the, the Chinese have become more discerning and more able to uh, expand elsewhere across the region. And so while Sudan was, uh, as you say, uh, really a, a flagship uh, partner for them, you know, for the for the better part of a decade or two, it really is uh, comparatively diminished today when you look around the region. It's fascinating. Boy, lots of pieces are in motion here. The, the article is Great Power Rivalry in the Red Sea, China's Experiment in Djibouti and Implications for the United States. This article is so timely right now, especially with everything that's going on in Saudi Arabia, Iran, Djibouti, and this part of the world. Again, it's an area that Kobus and I are expanding our focus on, and I think a great primer for this is to read Zach's article. Zach Verton is a non-resident fellow at the Brookings Institution in Washington. He joins us from the Great Lakes in Minnesota. Uh, Zach, if people want to follow what you're reading and writing these days, what's the best way for them to stay in touch with you? Well, you, all of my stuff is available at the Brookings website. Uh, the, the Red Sea project that I mentioned that I've been doing for the last couple of years can be found there uh, or uh, via Twitter. Um, happy to hear from people and to continue this discussion. And thanks again for having me. Yeah, fantastic. We will put your Twitter feed in our show notes and also links to your previous writings in our show notes as well. And I'll do a little plug. Zach is a subscriber to our newsletter. He gets our daily briefing every day. We hope that you're finding it useful and informative. Uh, we would love to invite uh, everybody to join. And by the way, just we, you know, Zach, we do a little bit of a, uh, a a little plug for our people who make it all the way to the end of the podcast. That if you people use the word podcast at checkout, they get a big discount. So ChinaAfricaProject.com slash subscribe. Kobus and I, we're we're on it every single day. Uh, Zach, thank you so much for subscribing. Thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Thanks, you guys, and looking forward to the next uh, discussion. Fantastic. Kobus and I will be back again next week with another episode of the China in Africa podcast. Until then, thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Head over to Facebook.com slash China Africa Project to share your thoughts on today's show. The guys are also on Twitter, where you can find Kobus at Stadinsky or Eric at E. Olander. And be sure to sign up for the weekly China in Africa email newsletter by going to www. Dot China Africa Project dot com.